we're going to get started now. But I think Will and I are more excited than the kids are. You know what I'm saying? I'm like looking at the screen at you guys. All these, I talk to Gary all about it. I'm always like, doctor. He probably thinks I'm just the corniest thing ever, but it's all good. Um, good afternoon, everybody. For all of you that don't know me, I'm Angela Richardson, and I'm the head of the IRC here. Um, welcome to our panel, Black Doctors, White Coats, featuring our dental alums from probably all of you are from early 2000s, right? This is awesome, just awesome. So we have a couple of students here from student group, uh, Med for Minorities for Med? Med for Minorities. And they're going to go through bios. So it'll be interesting for you all to hear them read about you. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our students. They're gonna introduce themselves to you and then they are going to read your bio. Hi, I'm, I'm Akshay Johan. I'm a soft rep. Um, you can back into the microphone. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a soft rep. I'm Akshay. Um, um, I'm Reagan Kelly. I'm a big software representative for Med Minorities. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, Dr. Bernice Oka is a member of the NIMSA class of 2010, but she currently works as an emergency medicine physician at UChicago. And her educational journey led her from INSA to Princeton for undergrad to a doctor of medicine from Emory University School of Medicine. Uh, Complemented by a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She is currently at U Chicago for residency, where she's finishing her fellowship in emergency medical services. Dr. Maya Lane is a member of the MC class of 2022, or sorry, 2002. She attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she completed her bachelor's of science degree. She then continued her education and obtained her medical degree um, from one of the only historically Black medical schools in the U.S., the Harry Medical College. Shortly after, Dr. Wade completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Wade State University, Detroit Medical Center in Detroit. Michigan and is now board certified obstetrician and gynecologist practicing in the south of Chicago at her own private practice, Contemporary OGI in Chicago. Dr. Lane. <laughs> Dr. Lane is also affiliated with North Western Princess Hospital on faculty at Northwestern University in Steinberg Medical Medicine. Um, she has a strong interest in advocacy for women health and risk equity, health equity overall on a local, state, and federal level. All right, next up, uh, Dr. Carrie Kennebrew, Jr. Uh, is a member of the class of- They can't see me. I stand right here so you can see me. You see how on the thing they can't see you? Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right. Over here, stand up. There. Now they can see. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Dr. Gary, Gary uh, Kennebrew Jr. graduated in 2004. He then attended uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and graduated with a bachelor's in biology. That same year, he enrolled at Loyola University at um, Chicago. Sorry, Loyola University Chicago Strict School of Medicine and was also awarded a full scholarship through the Army's Health Profession Scholarship Program. He completed the, his doctorate in medicine in 2012, and during his active duty commitment to um, as a physician in the Army, he had the opportunity to serve as a flight surgeon for the Aviation Combat Brigade and serve as a member of Forward, Resusc forward Resuscitative Surgical Team, uh, in addition to several trainings and duty stations across the U.S., he deployed to both Kuwait and Afghanistan. Thank you for your service. Dr. Arthur Pope is a member of the EMSA class of 2001. He studied chemistry at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Prior to medical school, he obtained his PhD in biochemical medical science at the University of Florida. After completing his postdoctoral fellowship, he decided to pursue medicine. 
He returned home to complete his medical degree at Loyola and residency training at the University of Chicago in emergency medicine, where he served as chief resident. Currently, Dr. Pope is an assistant professor of clinical emergency medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Parallel School of Medicine. In addition to his clinical work, he is faculty director of undergraduate pipeline program to the Perelman School of Medicine, co-director of underrepresented in medicine affairs for graduate medical education at UPenn. Dr. Pope has a passion for mentoring the next generation of medical students who are traditionally underrepresented in medicine. Making the road to medicine easier for the generation coming behind him is what motivates him for his tough principles. Um, Dr. Carl Lambert Jr. graduated in 2003. He's an assistant professor of family medicine at uh, Rush University Medical College in Chicago and is involved with academic medicine as well as mentorship. He enjoys providing thorough, passionate, and full person, um, full person continuity and preventative care to people from all communities and walks of life in the Rush University Family Physicians Group. Aside from clinical practice, Dr. Lambert remains very involved in the Rush community in several capacities, including being a committed and engaged clinical teacher and preceptor, a small group clinician, educator, and facilitator in Rush's integrated curriculum, director of the Rush Family Medicine Leadership Program, Director of the Service Learning Curriculum, and an executive member of the Medical Schools Admissions Executive Committee and Rush University Racial Justice Action Committee, as well as faculty advisor for both the Rush Christian Fellowship and minority medical students in the Rush chapter, Student National Medical Association. Dr. Lambert is a member of the American Association of Family Physicians, the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, a diplomat of the American Board of Family Medicine, member of the Christian Community Health Fellowship, and academic advisor for the National Medical Fellowship Primary Care Leadership Program, and an affiliate of the Chicago area Albert Schweitzer Fellowship Program. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? Okay, without further delay, we're actually going to get started. Um, I would like to introduce Will Perkins, who was here um, along with me when these folks were <laughs> uh, students here at IMSA. So as they're on their journey as professionals, uh, representing IMSA as well, um, they're also representing you because who they are is what you all will be. Um, I applaud them. And I applaud you for what you, you're going to do in the future to represent IMSA. So again, without further de delay, uh, Will Perkins, Chief Mission and Impact Officer. Hey, how you guys doing? Can you guys hear me? Or you want me to speak in the mic? Because I was going to say you guys never needed me in the mic when I was here. So I didn't know. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do, I'm going to be the MC. And I think what we forgot to do is talk about Dr. White who was also here when at least one of you were here, Bernice. So Dr. White is sitting in the front and the other four, uh, I've been around and you, I know you quite well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you a series of questions. We're gonna ask one question. We'd like each one of you to answer that question. We have roughly about an hour. So I will try to keep us on task as much as possible, but that could be hard. So. Do we have any students who's going to read the questions? If you want to just jump in and read the questions. Somebody has a question? Stand, stand up. Oh, you're fine. Stand up. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm Eric, and I just had a question about like what you wish you knew like before attending IMSA, like what you wish you could have gotten out of the IMSA experience more. Like, and uh, we'll do it this way. On from us looking at you, we start with Arthur, then Carl, then Mia, then Gary, and then Bernice. How about that? Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Pope. Okay, so what I wish I knew, um, 
I don't know. I, I think one thing I will say about IMSA, I think we were all kind of joking before we started that, you know, IMSA was rough. It was that easy. Uh, but I think uh, what I learned at the end of the day is to take risk um, and not be afraid to take those risks. I think, you know, we kind of get a little bit of uh, a little bit of, you know, hand swatting when we're there um, in terms of challenges. But, you know, I wouldn't have been able to make the career switch that I did without having, I think, going to IMSA because I was willing to take that risk and believed in myself um, and knew that, you know, even if I failed, like I just get back up and keep trying again. So I, th- I feel like that's one thing I've definitely taken away from IMSA. And, you know, in addition to like lifelong friendships um, that I've had for, you know, many decades now. So. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, what what uh, Arthur just said resonates. It was just our 20 year uh, reunion with them. So I was in that room back in, in uh, July, I think, and it was a pretty wild feeling. So um, the time moves really quickly, right? So that's something I wish I would have knew that when you graduate, I mean, it's just it's a snap of your fingers. And next thing you know, you, you'll you be fully fledged into your career. So I'd say really cherish the time that you have. IMSA was a very formative experience. It's a lot of work, but I think it really does help you, especially if you are considering a career in STEM or healthcare and such. Um, I agree. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Expand. I wish I probably, you know, I, I don't know if they still have that Wednesday program, the inquiry day. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like the I day. I probably wish I would have done a little bit more research stuff. Um, thinking back now as a faculty member, that's probably something that I'm a little bit weaker in. Um, but if I would have known a little bit more about like the, the just the pieces of how to create a project, that would have been helpful. Um, but otherwise, you know, it was a really good formal experience for me. And I, um, to echo what Arthur and Carl have already expressed, I feel the same way. I think the biggest thing was to know that taking risk is a, is a good thing. It's okay. And um, if you don't take those risks, you'll never know what your true potential is. And so I was one of the students. I was at a Chicago public school. I was in a band. I had my group of friends before I went to IMSA. And I was, you know, my whole life was uprooted when I when I got accepted. Everyone else was happy. But I was like, wait a minute, I need to stay with my my friends and um, continue on with the the known and not explore the unknown. And I think um, going to IMSA really taught me that uh, to not be afraid of the unknown, um, to always explore possibilities because you never know uh, the steps that they'll set you up for in the future. If there was anything, I can't really think of anything particularly that I wish I knew before going to IMSA, other than it was going to be a great experience that could set me up uh, for lasting friendships that have become like family and um, just taking advantage of the unique experience that you you get exposed to by being an IMSA student. Um, as far as my MC experience, one thing that I wish I would have known is, I guess, how to study. I mean, MC officially taught me that, but before I got there, I, you know, every everyone's the top of their class. Everyone's, you know, smart wherever they come from, but MC has a way of humbling you. Uh, it's a very, it's a very humbling experience. Uh, so I guess, and I, I don't know how who would have taught me that, how I would have learned that, but that's something that I think I would have known. Um, and then they, I mentioned, he alluded to how quickly time uh, moves. This summer is actually my 20 year uh, anniversary and it's, uh, and it's a, re- a reunion and it's flown by. Um, I wish, uh, and it's kind of ongoing, right? Instead of trying to put your, put your head down and just like, you know, focus on, okay, if I get, I can just get to this point and then I'll be okay. And then I just get to this point and then I'll be okay. And then you spend so much time just getting to the next point that you never have time to actually enjoy and cherish the journey, the process itself. Yeah, I think so many amazing pearls have already been shared. I, man, I really want to highlight, I want to reiterate two things that were said. One is the 
inquiry day, that SIR was really, really, it actually was like life-changing for me because I was able to take the project that I did at, from my I day and present it internationally. Like once I got to college. So if you really, you know, like find certain experiences, I think that completely set my resume apart and was really able, um, like a lot of people don't do research like that in high school. So the fact that we have like a dedicated day to be able to do that is really special. And I, there's no judgment. I totally understand that, you know, sometimes people want just like a day off or like a day to catch up on work. And that totally makes sense. But if you have the capacity at all, it really can be something that like totally, you know, just like changes your trajectory. So that's one thing. I really want to also um, reiterate something that Dr. Lane said, which is the connections that you make there are completely and totally unlike anything. And I've gone to so many institutions at this point, you know, between uh, doing a, my undergrad, a master's, residency, all these things, like the friendships that I made at IMSA have been so enduring and so special because you go through something so formative at such a young age that like, those are people that I still, there are, there are things that I wouldn't feel comfortable telling anybody, but my IMSA friends. And that is so special because you really are going to find that, especially doing something like medicine, you're going to really have people that you need to lean on and cry to. Like There are tears in this process. It is not always cute. So you need people that you're going to be able to cry to. Um, absolutely. So I think those are important. The one thing that I wish I would have known earlier and I eventually found out was that even though STEM is, you know, obviously the core of medicine, there is so much power in the kind of what they call the soft skills. I don't, I don't think they're soft, but things like leadership. I learned leadership at IMSA. I was president of the African American Student Association, and that was my first time leading an organization. That totally changed my perspective on leadership. I learned about social justice as a concept at IMSA by taking, by doing like J to um, what do they call it? The uh, that January term class or or whatever. There was like something about social justice, and that was when I started to get language on you know, racial disparities, social determinants of health, that sort of thing. And that totally carried me moving forward. So uh, just make sure that, you know, obviously you're going to get the math, you're going to get the science, intercession, thank you. Um, you're going to get the math, you're going to get the science, you're going to get all of that stuff, but also get the leadership skills, get the, um, and get the uh, connections and then learn about some of these other things like history and all of these things that can really change your life. What kind of scholarships did you guys have uh, and how did you find them? Um, so for medical school, um, unless you're doing something like Dr. Kenver, there's a limited number of scholarships that are available. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are like health professional scholarships, uh, uh, do like National Service Corps, they're, you know, military scholarships, uh, but those are very specific, especially if you're doing primary care. Um, and so, um, for example, I'm not, so I'm not a primary care physician, so I don't, I mean, even though I'm part-time, but, um, you know, that's all. <laughs> um, so, but my school had a lot of scholarships that they gave away. Um, and so I think that helped me. I think over my four years, I may got like $90,000 in scholarships and they had their own like internal process of like how they did it. We had to submit our CV and like a statement like every year. Um, and then when I started, I also had like a Dean's tuition scholarship that was like $10,000 every year. Um, and then when I finished residency um, due to National Medical uh, Fellowship Foundation, they don't have it anymore, I don't think, but there was a, a residency scholarship specifically for people who were training in Chicago, um, and that was like twenty five thousand dollars and twenty thousand dollars of that I took put towards my student loan. So, um, but that was after I completed residency. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Arthur. I, I kind of did a lot of it on the latter end. Um, I kind of piecemealed it. So I'm I'm a primary primary care doctor. So I took full advantage of the National Health Service Corps, where you. I guess there's two. So you could do a scholarship program where you you um, apply in medical school and they will pick a site for you to, to work at afterwards. I wanted a little bit more flexibility. So I did the loan repayment option where I get to find the site and I get to work there for as long as you like. And they will match a certain amount of money um, for the amount of years that you work there. Um, this may be beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think it's also important. And I think this this kind of is similar to what Bernice said. The power of a negotiation, like leadership and also negotiating. So eventually you're going to come to a point in your career where you're going to have power 
to negotiate things like payment, how many patients you choose to see, time off, PT, all these different things. So I wasn't afraid to negotiate when I, I changed sites from working out near my hometown and actually coming to do academic medicine to negotiate, hey, I would like a certain amount of my loans to be paid if I'm going to make this move, right? I'm a Black physician. I'm a, I'm a person of color. I know the talents that I bring, and I, I wanted to use that as leverage, right? Um, so there's all sorts of different opportunities beyond scholarships that will be more attainable to you as you get further in your career. And then for those of you that don't want to go to medical school or you're not sure, as far as looking for scholarships for college, that's a whole different that's a whole different game as well. You can really just Google scholarships for college and you'd be surprised um, what's available. Now they have like some of the like Coca-Cola and some of the big ones, but what you do is like look in your own local community because there's churches that have scholarship funds, fraternities and sororities that have scholarship funds. And you know, over time, you know, you have three thousand dollars here, two thousand dollars here, another thousand here. Next thing you know, those thousands of dollars add up. So there's nothing wrong with with like in, in a sense piece it and then finding a whole bunch of small scholarships and it's, instead of just kind of going for the big fish, because at the end of the game, still at the end of, at the end of the day, the goal is to uh, get school paid for. Um, and I'll also say that a lot of the scholarships can come from institutions specifically. So uh, I think, and I, I, I would argue maybe some of those are the highest ones. And those are really kind of hard to find. You have to dig through the websites a lot. But sometimes if you go to the school specific website, like say you're, you know, you want to be in med school, you know, in a particular city or something, then go to each individual school and then look at what scholarships that they have within the school, because they'll usually, not always, but they'll usually have like at least a couple that are like full tuition scholarships for like five people or, or like a couple people or something like that. Um, they're obviously extremely competitive, but you know, if you apply to, if you apply a bit strategically and apply to a lot of the schools that have that type of an opportunity, then you can maybe increase your chances, but medicine can be tough. One thing I could also speak to though, is if you do anything in addition to medicine, so like, um, like a master's degree, like I did a master's in public policy in addition to medicine, I really recommend trying not to take additional debt on for that. If you can avoid it, it can be tough sometimes, but those ones I found, I found more scholarship opportunities for that. And so, you know, there are ways to like, if you're, if you're doing things to enrich your education, just like try to minimize costs just because medicine is already quite expensive. And sorry, one last thing. If you have siblings in college, that was actually like how a lot of my loans were a lot cheaper. Like if you have multiple siblings in college at the same time, make sure you claim that in your FAFSA, make, make sure your financial aid office knows that, write letters. My mom was like a master at that. Like sometimes things don't show up in your FAFSA that are difficult. Like maybe you're helping to, you know, support your family. Like maybe you have, you know, other obligations write letters and really clarify, like, these are the financial obligations I have. So it's really difficult for me to make this work. And you, and they might be able to move a little bit on, um, on how much funding they give you or merit base. Yeah, I, um, everyone just really gave great advice. I don't really have much extra to add outside of at IMSA, there was like a little, uh, career center office where they had information about scholarships that was like right by the stairs. Um, and I remember going in there and getting a lot of information for scholarships for undergrad. Um, and those resources helped me out even going to a, um, an in-state school. They were very helpful in like helping me find the scholarships that weren't just, you know, um, financial need, but more merit-based scholarships as well. And then I did everything on the back end, like Carl, where I um, am doing like the loan repayment through like public service loan forgiveness. And so there's ways where if you have to take out uh, more loans because you're not getting the scholarships, there are ways to give back um, and have those loans forgiven or discounted or, you know, um, paid on by your employer or by the government. Thank you. We have so there's like a lot of pressure in like minority households to become a doctor. It's a very like lucrative job position. So when did you know like medicine is actually for you? 
Um, so I'll start. So yeah, um, I would say like I'm first generation college student. Like my parents didn't know anything even about applying for college. Like I did all the FAFSA. I was like, mom, I need your signature and your taxes, right? So for them, they were just like, I'm happy that you're going to college. Um, and I had a career change. So I actually went I was a researcher um, before I went into medicine. So when I when I was at IMSA, I remember taking a genetics class and we were in the, is it the, I forgot, the Granger lab. Um, and we were doing like PCR, which was like new technology back then, which is now it's not. Um, that kind of like started my interest in research. And then during college, um, I participated in McNear Scholars Program. And so the person I was working with is an MD PhD and he's like it sounds like you want to go to grad school so that's how I ended up going to grad school but the research that I chose is because I was like well heart disease affects you know my community black folk um and then I I kind of missed the like personal interaction that you get with medicine that sort of like satisfaction at the end of the day that you've helped somebody potentially you know change their life research does that but that's like way down the line um and so that's why I ended up making a pivot and so it wasn't much like it was like after grad school like I was 20 I was 31 when I started med school um and so for me it was just kind of like figuring out that medicine was a better path for like what I wanted to do um in terms of mentorship and taking care of my community yeah um, I'll add this. Um, I, I have the opportunity to interview and screen all sorts of different applicants over the last almost 10 years. So I'd say before you choose medicine, make sure that you're sure. Um, it's a big commitment. It's a big obligation. Um, and you need to make sure that you're that you're aware of that, that you've, you've done the due diligence to make that choice. Um, when I interview some applicants, it's clear that they were, you know, when you interview, sometimes it's like they just check boxes, like they just kind of did activities and stuff, but they didn't quite tie into the why behind why they were doing it. So, you know, and again, this is down the line, but when you start picking and choosing and talking to advisors about what activity and service or research, make sure that it's a common thread as to why does this fit your personality? What do you want to do? What's your, what's your mission? If you were to become a physician, what do you want to do with that per se? Um, for me, I knew pretty early on because I have two younger brothers with um, special needs. They were, were, were born with autism and actually they got a lot of their care at Rush, which is why I work at now. So I became very, very curious about the human condition and tying, you know, medicine and the human body, but also with the social piece, right? Treating people as individuals, treating families as a unit and using that knowledge to help people um, no matter what their walk of life was, right? So that was kind of like the initial interest. And I think as a physician, you're able to wear a lot of different hats. You can be a teacher, mm -hmm. certainly you're a clinician, but you can be an innovator, you're a counselor, you do all sorts of different things. And that really, really appealed to me. Um, so I knew pretty early on, and I just chose different experiences or just was fortunate to meet different folks or mentors that just kind of confirmed that that path would make the most sense for me. Yeah, I kind of did the same thing. Um, I I was one of those people that, you know, my family told me that I told them at the age of four I wanted to be a doctor. I don't even recall it, but it seems like, you know, medicine was always something that I had an interest in. And because I expressed that interest, they fed into me. And, you know, I, I was the one looking for summer medical programs to get the exposure. So every summer I was enrolling or telling my parents, hey, can I get enrolled in this program from high school on um, to get the exposure? And so I think the exposure to medicine is what allowed me to say like, oh, okay, this is something that I was, you know, I've always said I wanted to do, but it's really something that I want to do. Um, I, I think I know people that went into medicine for reasons where they felt like pressured because they have uh, family members that are in the medical field and they're not happy. And like it was mentioned before, you have to really, this has to be a passion of yours because everyone sees um, us when we're being presented in situations like this, but they don't see the long hours, the sacrifices that are made to get to these points in life. And so making sure that it's something that you want to do and you make sure by being exposed, I think is like the biggest piece of advice that I hope you guys can take away. 
um, you know, exposure, 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 and getting that experience so you can know that this is something that you want to do. And you might not know what field of medicine until medical school and much later on because it's hard to get a true sense of that. Um, but just knowing that, you know, you have a passion for something, whatever that passion is, the work is just second nature to it. Yeah, I co-sign everything that's been said. Um, for me, I I didn't have like in I I think I have like some cousins and stuff that had done medicine that had married into the family, but we didn't have doctors like in my family. So for whatever reason, because of kind of the lore of being a doctor, like my grandfather really wanted my dad to be a doctor. My dad said that is not my portion, and so my dad was like, "Okay, I need you to do it. <laughs> I going to do it for grandpa." But somebody got to be this doctor. It's like, it's kind of a, I don't know. It's kind of like a prestige thing, whatever. So I really did not want to be a doctor for these reasons. Cause I really, really do not like prescriptions like that. And I was like, no, I need to find my own thing. Like I'm going to do something else. And, um, I think a few things happened. I was like, I was looking and I totally encourage you guys all to look elsewhere. There's look elsewhere before you commit to this, just because this is like, it's so high stakes people who go into this and don't want to go into it are, are to be frank dangerous, right? Cause like you don't want to come in and be burnt out and then be dealing with people at the hardest day of their lives at their most vulnerable, all of those things. Like there are so many other places that are probably more suited for you. If you're not, if you don't want to do this, right. So explore, explore, like everybody has said, but for me, similar to what, um, you know, Dr. Pope said, Pope said earlier, I knew that I wanted I wanted that in individual interaction. I think there's like nothing like it, but I, I was like, maybe I can get the same feeling if I do like, you know, public health. Cause I wanted to do something that was social justice oriented. You can do education, you can do, you know, climate activism, you could do criminal justice work. There, there's so many things, but health was like a very interesting one to me because I feel like it's literally, it's very tangible. Like you can see the effects of what you do. Like it literally affects the human body and it, it affects everyone. So I like the health piece, but I was like, oh, I could do, you know, public health and, you know, uh, maybe a tech startup. I don't know. I was thinking about all this stuff. But then when I realized that number one, the cool thing about being a doctor is you don't have to say no to those other things. And like, I'm a testament to that. A lot of people here are a testament to that. Like you can still be a doctor and you can work for a tech startup. You can be a doctor and you can do public health work and like sit yeah, on yeah, committees. Yeah. You can be an educator. Like there are so many things that you can do. So I think when I realized that me being a doctor was not necessarily pigeonholing me, but it was actually opening up a lot of opportunities where I would still get that, the really, the power of the bedside communication, the bedside impacts that I can have with people, but I'm not closing off my opportunity to like start a business or to do whatever it is that you might be thinking. For me, it became very appealing and emergency medicine specifically was very, very appealing because it's a very flexible schedule. I can work a set number of shifts and then I can, you know, go explore whatever other opportunities on the side. But there are ways that you can make it work in, in any specialty. So um, so I've been very, very happy with it. But again, it's not for everyone. So please explore. I wanted to be a professional football player. I wanted to go to the NFL um ever since i was a little kid and my dad set me down one day and told me the odds i ch ch chance i had of <laughs> the NFL, even if i was good enough you know injury and all those things he says you need to have a backup plan and my backup plan was to be a doctor so it's something that i've wanted to do my, my entire life both my parents are you know uh first generation college graduates um my mom was in healthcare. She was a nurse midwife at Cook County, now Strozier, for many years. Um, but there was never the pressure from them to for me to be a doctor. It was the pressure that I put on myself because once I decided that's what, that's what I wanted to do, you couldn't tell me otherwise. And I was, that's something that, that's what I was going to do. Um, however, I will say that, a um, little story time here, after COVID, I got pretty, um, and once COVID, once uh, things kind of started to turn to normal in the ER, I got pretty burnt out and I considered switching specialties um, or even like, maybe like, do I should I even be doing medicine at all? Um, I just, it was not like in my practice environment. I was like, I can't figure this out. I'm like, I'm going to work. I'm, I'm dreading it as is it, the, is it the hours I'm working? Um, 
you know, as far as like the, the, the type of shift I'm working? Is it the the patient population I'm seeing? I, I just I couldn't figure it out. I mean, eventually I did, and um, I'm still doing uh, EM, um, but I just want to know it's not this whole EM or medicine in general is not for the faint of heart. You have to really know that it's what you want to do because once you do those four years of college, when you go four years of, four years of med school, can you always go change? Yes, you can. Um, but it is it is it is a serious commitment. Um, and like everyone else was saying, there's nothing wrong with those other opportunities out, out there. Like I said, I did I wish I know, I don't know if it made a difference, but I still I wish I known all the, the the cool things you could do instead of being a doctor. Like as far as legitimately being an architect or being someone that's just all they do is design software for X or all they do is is production. Um because my other than sports, my love was music. I, I love, love music. So like writing, composition, music theory, playing instruments. Um, and I was I was afraid to do that um, because, um, well, one, I still wanted to be a doctor, but I was afraid to do it because I was concerned about taking that risk, the fear of the unknown and how I will be able to be successful and care for myself and all those things. So I don't want you guys to experience that same thing. I think you, whatever your passion is, follow that and stick with that. Don't be afraid to pursue that because at the end of that road, if it's truly want to want what you want to do and be, is is your actual own true happiness. Um and it's taken a it's taken a while for me to find that. Like I was telling you before, I was so focused on, man, I just gotta get through MSA. Boom. Okay. Now I'm in college. Now I just gotta, I just gotta get to med school, get medical school. Boom, got to medical school. Okay, now I just gotta get out of medical school, get in residency. Okay, cool. Okay, now I'm out of res. Now I'm finally out. I finally out of, out of residency, and then it's like, what do I do now? Right. Um. So it was um very eye opening and a very um almost like a come to Jesus moment, for if you if if you will, where I really had to kind of assess things in my life and figure out. Uh, what was important because there was a time where my life was figurative, figuratively in, in shambles and I had to be put back together again. So uh, sorry, I'm getting long-winded, but I just wanted to stress the importance of knowing what it is you want to do in your heart and sticking with that. Um, fortunately, I am able to do other things now. So uh, I've done the CrossFit competitions, uh, cycling. I'm still, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually back to, I'm playing playing, you know, playing my, playing my guitars again. So just, there's, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but just, just be sure that's what you want to do. Thank you, Gary. We got another question. I was wondering how you balance mental and your, like, your social life and just being a person in general. Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, Gary spoke very eloquently on this. I think, um, especially, you know, pandemic was very hard on all of us, um, you know, in various different ways. And, you know, medical training, um, you know, being honest with you, it takes a lot from you, right? Like you're, you're studying for these four years and in your residency for three to seven years, you know? Um, and so you miss out on a lot of things. And so I've spent the last couple of years sort of like trying to rebuild all of that up. Um, and so for me, like the big things that I do, I love to travel. Um, and so my friends at work make fun of me because I say I'm a bougie traveler. So like, I will fly business if it's cheap to like go seven hours somewhere, right? Because those are the things that I enjoy doing now, right? Um, other things I like to do is photography. So like I take my camera wherever I go with me and I like, you know, print it out my pictures and hang them up in my apartment. Um, I have a personal trainer now to like make sure, you know, I'm trying to get the summer 20 body, you know? Uh, and so those are the ways that I feel like I've tried to like balance it. And even in medical school, I tried really hard you know, I made a conscious effort. And I think it's because I was just older at that point that like, yeah, this test is important, but like seeing my family is equally as important because like, they're the ones that are going to be for me at the end of the day, like when things get rough, uh, my friends are going to be the ones that are there for me, not this test and not this school, you know? Um, so I really tried to make sure that I balanced that enough to be like, okay, I passed the test, but like, I want to go out for my birthday and see my friends. I want to see my family. Um, and I was living in Chicago. Um, and even now as an attending, it's the same thing. Like, people will be like, you're always on vacation. I was like, cause I need to be, you know, <laughs> like I need that break. I need to get away. Um, and then so I can reset for myself. So I think that's how I, you know, try to balance it. 
Wow. A lot, a lot of transparency going on. This is, this is awesome. This is real. Um, I, I tell my students and I'll say this to you guys, you, you, who is not what you do. You, who is not what you do, right? Being a physician is, it's important, right? You don't want to be a quack. <laughs> you want to be well-trained and care for your patients and stuff, but that's not the end all be all of who you are, right? Um, so I think one thing that I'll add to the discussion is that for balance, I'm learning how to say no. Uh, sometimes, you know, no is a complete sentence. It took me a while. One of my mentors had to say, no is a complete sentence. It's okay to say no. I think especially as people of color, we feel like we have to be like the hero, right? There's a tax, right? You're asked to do many, many things um, that are kind of separate from what some of your colleagues may be asked to do. You're kind of asked to stand at the gap, to champion DEI stuff, to mentor, and, and all that is well and good. But you have to figure out how much you can handle in a given season and, and be okay with that. So my story time, like Gary said, my story time is this. So uh, I have two young kids and that really ch changed what I said yes or no to and, and define balance. So my I have a one-year-old daughter and a two and a half year old son. So my son, he was born very early, he was born at 27 weeks and he spent about nine months in the intensive care unit um, because his lungs were very weak and he actually required a breathing tube and, and, and support, right? So I remember I was kind of doing a million one things at, at school, teaching and clinic and all that stuff. And I, I kind of had to have a come to Jesus moment to kind of say like, okay, I'm going at 110. I have to cut back to maybe 30% now. And I need everyone else to be okay with that, right? How long? I don't know, right? This is a very uncertain situation. And it forced me to reprioritize what's really important. It's like, Yes, I will I will do all the things that are required, but I, I don't think in this moment I'm going to try to be super, <laughs> super doctor right now. The most important thing at that time was to be to be dad, to be a supportive husband and, and be present for those who really needed me the most. Right. So there's an ebb and flow in that that only you can really decide and those who know you best that could be saying no, that could be going on a vacation every quarter or whatever that is. Right. You need to figure out what really will keep you thriving and sustaining yourself as you go through your career. I think um, to add to that, one thing that I always, that helped me get through medical school and residency and just like every challenging uh, portion of my life is just like, it's delayed gratification, right? So I knew that with time, I would be able to uh, do all the things, like go to all of the events that I was seeing my friends go to. Um, but at that moment, I had to focus. And I, I really use that term for med school and residency because it's truly, um, as much as you want to be there, um, sometimes you're not able to, to be present for everyone's graduation or everyone's celebration that you are normally used to being a part of. So I would just keep reminding myself that this is just delayed gratification. I'm putting in the work now to reap the rewards later. Um, when later hit, I realized that you had to create those opportunities like Carl and Arthur were talking about um, to, to make sure that you maintain um, your level of sanity and happiness and um, you put in front what's, you know, what you value and you make time for that. And so one of the ways I had to carve that out as uh, being an OBGYN was to create my, to do a non-traditional um, medical practice where I'm working in my own private practice, but there's a couple of days out the week where I might do locums. So locum tenens work is where you have contracts with facilities that need doctors and they don't have doctors that they have routinely, but you might work for them for a couple weeks to a couple months and you are still having the flexibility to create the lifestyle and the schedule that you want. So I bring that up because that's far away from now for you all, but just to tell you that there are traditional routes that you can practice medicine, um, but then there's also non-traditional routes as well where you can still carve out a lifestyle that you're happy with. Yeah, absolutely. Cosine times a million, everything that has been said. I think it's, I really want to reemphasize that, like really curating what you can. And it gets easier with time. 
hundred percent. Med school was a was tougher to pre med. <laughs> oh, it's a long thing. Anyway, pre med is even tough, right? Like people are going out every single night in college, and I had a physics quiz. So I was like, I actually like had this reputation. I continue to have this reputation of like, Bernice will just fit it all in. So it's like, I knew that there was always this like party that happened in the basement of this like residence hall in college. That was like such a fun party. But I also knew that I needed to pass my finals. So I would go to the library above it and I would put in work. Like I would literally go like bring my food up. I'm working, working, working so I could get through. But my reward was I was going to go to this party for an hour and a half. So I would literally leave my books, still leave everything up. I'll go to the party, dance with my friends, see everybody, and then go back upstairs and keep studying. And like, you just have to, you have to make time for it. Like for me, I was like, I need to see people. Like, that's like, I need, I need that. Like I need to be connected with people. Um, and I need to not feel like I'm totally missing out on all of my experience, but I also know that I have goals. And so finding that balance was really important. And I had friends that had like very similar mindsets. So we would all just be like, all right, like, you know, is it time to go to black box? We go, we'd be like, oh, you feel good about that? Okay, cool. Let's like come back and do our thing. So I think finding your, finding a community that's very like-minded and it was very similar in med school. I had, I, it sounds corny, but like trying to make studying fun, like, you know, we would be in that anatomy lab and like, those were my friends. Like we would be in there late hours, but we would like start blasting our favorite music and just be like, you know what, we're going to find this vessel. We're going to find this muscle and we're going to like have a good time. And like, now that I'm way past it, I'm many years past that, but I look back on anatomy lab and I'm like, wow. Like I think of those memories of like laughing and like teaching each other, doing like study sessions, like really positively. Cause that's how I connected with people. And we were cheering each other on to get through this very long, very difficult process. And then in residency, I had a great time. You know, Arthur and I actually went to residency together. He was my chief resident. And we are a program that's known to be outside, as they say. Like, we have a great time. We have a very, very amazing work-life balance where it's like when we're at work, I feel so happy because I'm like, I'm serving the patients I wanted to serve. Like, I really feel like I'm doing what I set out to do. When I leave, I make sure I'm having fun. You know what I mean? But I, I think the one other thing, since I'm up here, actually, I think this will be kind of unique is like making work fun. Oh, the weather is terrible, unfortunately. But um, one part of my job right now is I work, um, I'm doing pre-hospital medicine, which is like medicine outside of the hospital. And one really amazing thing I get to do is fly with um, the um, University of Chicago Aeromedical Team which is like an amazing thing. Normally it would be a lot better, but it's like raining or something right now. But like right now I'm like literally on the helipad is like where I'm reporting from. Let's see if I can show you it. Usually there's like a helicopter out here, but it's raining right now. But this is just like, this is so fun. Like, I think it's really, really important to find things that make your job interesting, that that I'm like, I never in my wildest dreams would I think that I was doing something like this, but it's every day is different. Every day is really, really fun. Um, and then when I'm off, I'm making sure I'm filling my cup, connecting with people, traveling, doing all of those things. So there's a lot of ways to like really make your life enriching. All right. I'm going to take it back a few steps. Pre-specialties, pre-career, even now. Okay. I got three things I want you to do. Get you a hobby. Get you a friend. And get you some flowers. And what I mean by that is find the hobbyist, find something that you enjoy, something that fulfills you. Do that and maintain that. Uh, don't um, do like I did and just kind of you get so singular focus. You get that tunnel vision and you 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 waste everything. You stop doing the things you like to do. You you know you get stressed. You get overwhelmed. You you know you start you communicate less with your friends. All of these things that are meant to fulfill you and sustain you and build that foundation. Uh, so that way you can propel yourself for it. Uh, you will lose those things. So get you a hobby. That's friends. Get you friends. Get some people that um, that you enjoy. Get some people that you can depend on. Uh, that that's some form of reciprocity. That take that 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 um, that true uh, friendship through thick and thin because they're going to be there with you no matter what. And keep them as you go through your life. Keep those relationships. Um, just like the work you put into school, you also have to put in work to maintain those relationships. Just like you have to put in work for all this self-care, right? Um, don't forget, it's, we can't say this enough. 
do not forget how important it is to take care of you. Because if there is no you, you're not going to get to your goals. Point plain and simple. And what I mean by get your flowers is it's take time to stop and enjoy the things around you, around you. Enjoy the journey because it will go by in the blink of an eye. And all you're going to have is either um, good times or regrets. And I don't want you to have any regrets. Like, oh, I should have done. I should have been kinder. I should have spent more time studying. I should have spent well, more likely. I should spend more time hanging out, building relationships, building myself. Um, so just don't forget about those things. So even before you get to like medicine and your career, these are things that you can do and implement now, even in your high school years. Um, I had one more thing. I think I just lost it, but uh, yeah. So. Uh, yes, we got about five more minutes, but if you guys will hang on a little longer, we have one more question. You guys don't mind. Um, so one thing I find really interesting is how different careers in medicine can be even as a doctor. So I was wondering kind of what it is you do in your profession exactly and like what your professions are. Um, so like three out of five of us are emergency medicine. Um, but, and that can look different depending on where you practice, right? Um, so like I said, Bernice and I trained together at UChicago, um, which, you know, was very, a lot of very, very acutely sick patients, a lot of trauma patients. Um, but it was also like great because you were taking care of the people that you wanted to be taken care of. Um, where I work now, it's a little bit different. Um, so Penn has four emergency departments. Um, so I work at the main hospital and then a community site. Um, the main hospital, uh, uh, it's a little bit more of like chronic sick people. So we have a lot of, you know, Penn is a big cancer uh, place. So you have a lot of patients who are getting these like weird therapies that I'm trying to figure out, like what are the side effects of these therapies and having to learn um, from the residents. Um, and so that is just like a higher level of thinking that I didn't have to think about as much in residency. Um, and then when I go to the community site, it reminds me much more of like where I practice at UChicago. Uh, I'm taking care of the people directly in West Philly. They're coming in, yeah. um, you know, they could be sick or just like very minor things that, you know, unfortunately they don't have access to care. Um, and so we be kind of come, you know, their, their primary doctor at that point. Um, so it just really depends on your practice environment, um, at least for EM. And I think for all specialties, it really depends what your day looks like. And the thing about EM, no day looks the same. So that's kind of why I like it. Yeah. Similarly, family medicine, um, a lot of folks will describe it as kind of like cradle to grave type care. Um, so you can see patients of all ages. Uh, earlier in my career, I used to even do deliveries and stuff. Uh, but now I'm old and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> but a lot of the mainstays of what we do is primary care and prevention. So, you know, you're with the doctors that really try to keep you out of like the emergency room or out of the ICUs and managing chronic conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, things that if if if, we, if they're neglected or if there's no access to care for those things, um, then it really can add up. And a lot of times that does affect black and brown populations more than others. So I do care very deeply about that. Um, the other piece of what I do is it's academic medicine. So I spend a lot of time with medical students. So that's a really formative time where you're trying to figure out what do you want to do with your career you're in, what type of doctor, what sort of skills you need to gain, how do you pass these tests, how do you psychologically make it, you know, all these different things like imposter syndrome. Sometimes you can feel like you're maybe a fluke or you don't quite belong. So I get to, to really walk with students as they evolve and figure out what their professional identity will be. Um, so as a solo private obstetrician gynecologist, and I'm what we consider a generalist. So I do obstetrics, which is prenatal care for pregnant people. And then I also do gynecology, which is um, health care, where it's uh, primary care, doing annual exams, to doing in-office procedures, to doing surgeries in the operating room. And so um, I always tell people that obstetrics and gynecology is a unique field. And we all feel like our fields are unique, right? And we could tell you why we chose them because it's our passion. But it's I think it's truly unique in the sense that I'm taking care of 
in the obstetrics world, two patients at once. I'm dealing with um, a pregnant person and a baby. And uh, once the baby is out, they go to the pediatricians. But until then, I take care of both. And so it's a unique period. And that's actually what drew me to the field of obstetrics and gynecology. It was that it's such a unique period in a person's life to to bring life into the world and to be um, able to be a part of that experience and to kind of help form that experience for my patients. It's like a true honor. I tell my patients all the time, it's an honor uh, to be your physician and during this time um, and to make sure that, you know, I can safely bring them both to the other side of pregnancy. Um, and then I love the spontaneity of the, the field as well. So I can go from seeing, doing a surgery uh, to remove fibroids and open abdominal myomectomy in the morning to seeing patients throughout the day to rushing out of my office to doing a delivery um, in the evening time and then finish up with, you know, calling patients about their pap smears. And so it's just a wide range of things that I can do uh, within my field. So that's why I chose obstetrics and gynecology and that's actually what I do. Um, I went into private practice because I felt like I wanted the autonomy to create the the day-to-day -day, uh, practice that I wanted to have. I didn't want to be um, inundated with certain, um, seeing so many patients in a certain amount of time where I couldn't provide the type of care that I wanted to provide. And so I created a space where patients, it's like a, a wellness spa, um, but I'm not doing IV infusions. Um, you know, they come in, they we have music, soft music playing. They get all the frills of uh, being in like a spa setting, but it's a doctor's office. And so that's what made me go into private practice so I can create the environment that I wanted and see patients at the pace that I want to see them in and have that autonomy. Um, so I'm also emergency medicine. I'm doing academic emergency medicine. Um, like Dr. Pope is. Uh, I'll speak on some of the fellowships and stuff though that can come out of it. So there are every specialty, and this is just kind of like a testament to the American healthcare system, it's become very, very specialized. So, you know, if you do internal medicine, that that's one internal medicine doctor might be, you know, general, you know, primary care, but then you'll have someone who's doing, who's cardiologist specializing in the heart. You might have somebody who, do, who does ICU and intensivist that's always in the ICU. You know, you can have somebody that specializes in um, gastroenterology. That's like all about the bowel and they do a lot of procedures. Um, in emergency medicine, we, most people stay more general in emergency medicine, but you know, I'm doing a specialty, which is pre-hospital medicine, which has been pretty amazing because it's all about how do we do medical care outside of the hospital. So it includes, you know, how do you do medical direction for paramedics and EMTs, but also how do you do event medicine? So we staff things like the marathon, we staff concerts, we staff sports, um, a lot of sports stuff. Um, and then there's, you know, flight medicine, search rescue, all of those sorts of things. So there's a, a lot with that. Um, so there are so many paths you can take. I think two things that you'll end up an answering for yourself, and this will be later in your career is one, do you kind of want to be more procedural or do you want to be more, uh, you know, less procedural. I'll just say it that way. So more procedural are things like surgeons and emergency medicine. We do quite a bit of procedures as well. Um, OBGYN does a lot of procedures, obviously. So do you want to do things with your hands or do you feel like you really want to kind of go deep, 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 deep into like differential diagnoses and be like a really deep kind of diagnostician type of a person? that's going to be like kind of a whole nother set of specialties that you might want to do. Um, and then you can kind of do things that like kind of traverse that border in a lot of ways. Um, so you'll have plenty of time to, to think through it, but there are so many options. I don't think I have anything to add. I, I think I've spoken enough today. Uh, first of all, uh, leadership, I want to say thank you for uh, coming and being part of this. I think going in the future, we may be discussing about extending it, but also from the academy, I want to say thank you 
for allowing the academy to be part of what has become amazing uh, people. Because uh, I just remember at least four of you, young people just trying to figure it out, you know, letting the academy uh, help you with that. So thank you, thank you. Uh, just an amazing group of young people today. Uh, and, and just keep doing what you're doing. And, and I hope that some of these young people sitting behind me may reach out and may need a little mentoring, may need a little push, may need a little help and be there to support them. And, and thank you for that. So we're going to wrap up and maybe we can get you guys on, some of you guys and girls and women, not girls, women on campus to uh, kind of hang out with the students and, and do an in-person thing. So thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, hey guys, can you give a round of applause? Thank you. To our panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. This was awesome. So phenomenal. Thanks again. Talk to you all soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye.